Our state has some incredible problems. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. I'm here to talk about that with you and talk about the trends that have shaped this state and dragged us in one direction or another. We're not really doing what, we're not realizing the dream we had way back in the early 2000s or even around 2008 or 9 or 10. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. Welcome to Wild Biz Nebraska. We're going to get it on right now. Are you smarter than a frog? <laughs> it's a crazy question to ask, but it has a lot to do with changing our minds. I'm going to talk to you about that today. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. I'm running the Wild Biz Nebraska show here with you, and I'm appreciative that you are with me because we're going to talk about a lot of things uh, that I think are relevant if you are a business owner, business manager, a salesperson, an economic developer, a mayor. Please listen carefully. Now, you might recall years ago um, that uh, there was a, a, a metaphor that was very common. Everybody talked about it now and then. And that is the fact that if you take a frog and you drop a frog in a, in a pan of water or a pot of water, it's cool. But then slowly you turn up the heat underneath the pot and eventually the, the, the water becomes um, you know, boiling almost. And of course, the frog um, dies, to, uh, to put it nicely. And, uh, and so this is something that we, we use as an example of, of people that are unable to change their point of view about something. So they basically just kind of die, quote unquote, metaphorically, in this pot of water and life leaves them in the lurch. Now, this is what is happening in the state of Nebraska. We've seen it again and again, although Nebraska has some wonderful statistics. There are some, some good things that have really happened in our state of Nebraska, but essentially, especially insofar as population is concerned, insofar as attracting people to our state is concerned, or retaining young professionals here in the state of Nebraska, that's, that is a different um, situation and the metaphor uh, is not exactly the same. So, so here's the idea. If you, if you are a mayor of any of the 183 communities here in the state of Nebraska that uh, will say they have 2,500 people or more right here in Nebraska, if you're a mayor, if you're an economic developer, um, if you're a chamber e executive or maybe even a city council member, we're talking now about maybe close to a thousand people um, that are responsible as they kind of divide up for this 183 communities here in the state. And these are people that feel the heat, <laughs> uh, metaphorically, and they have an opportunity. They have an opportunity, unlike the frog that we opened the show with, they can climb out of that pot of water that is getting increasingly hot and change their minds and make a, a decision to seek out new information, uh, look for new data, um, think about new strategies, uh, and a new way to talk about their community and, and a new way to market and sell their community. And oh, by the way, a good portion of those, we'll call it a thousand, although it's not exactly right, um, uh, those people, uh, many of them are bitter uh, and naive. Uh, they can't figure out why people don't want to come watch their library or come to their schools and they're very good and people do well there, people are happy there, why doesn't everybody come here? I don't understand, I'm unhappy with these people, see? So <clears throat> we think about marketing and branding our community. I don't care whether it's Fairberry or Wayne or Alliance, uh, doesn't really matter, Valentine, all over the state of Nebraska. And we say, we've got this, we've got this, and we have these qualities, we have these features. I mean, why can't these kids come out here and stay here and come here and work and take over the community? And then somebody did some research a few years back and and determined that within 500 miles, we're talking about going all the way over to uh, central Iowa, southern South Dakota, and so on, there's at least 200 communities in that area that talk about and emphasize and promote exactly, exactly the same features that I'm referencing here in the state of Nebraska. Now, when they, when they see this and when they realize 
that they can't differentiate themselves by thinking the same way and doing the same things as they've been doing for many, many years. It worked until about 10 or 20 years ago, um, but now it doesn't seem to work anymore. So these are, are, are frustrated people, cynical people, and uh, they need to like kind of lose that mindset and climb out of that boiling pot of water, so to speak, and start looking for fresh and exciting uh, new strategies and opportunities. And you're going to get that to some extent here tonight, right here at Wild Biz Nebraska. And again, I'm Lynn Hinderocker. Now, before I go down that road, let me just say this to you. <clears throat> There's certain types of data that people are comfortable working with, like demographics, so their ages and so on, and they make this much money, et cetera. So we're, we're over relying perhaps on what I just mentioned to you, demographics. But there's a whole nother way to look at um, a group of people, and that is called psychographics. Many of you heard this phrase, although it's a little difficult to put your hands on, but essentially it implies the mindset, the lifestyle, how they rationalize, how they think, how they do things, how they maybe form their values and so on. These are major drivers when uh, a bright, uh, well-educated person and maybe a spouse are deciding where they should go live and work, right? And what company they should work for and so on. And uh, psychographics are a little more fluid and uh, a little more unfamiliar to most people. So uh, they're, they're struggle with that. And you know what we do when we, when we come across information that is unfamiliar to us, what, what do we do? Well, I don't know about that. And we shove it off to the end of the table and uh, try to move on without actually giving that data um, close examination. And that's what we need to do right now. Now, a couple years ago, I had the privilege of talking to some young folks. Um, I would call them Gen Z, I guess is a common phrase these days, uh, over in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we chatted for about an hour and a half, two hours, I guess it was, over coffee. And all of these young folks, very bright, they graduated with honors in some cases, but they had all decided they were, in fact, going to leave the state of Nebraska whenever they had the opportunity. They were all working at that point, but um, they, they had definitely decided, and they had situations that they were looking at, they were going to leave the state. It's classic. It's classic. You know, we've got 4,600 a year, these folks leaving the state. So I was the one who asked them, and I had this opportunity in kind of a, kind of a focus group, and I said, why, why are you going? Why are you leaving? And they erupted. You know, they, they had a lot to say, because I, apparently I'm, I was the only one that had asked it, that question in a very straightforward way, and they had lots to say. And the very first thing, I'm going to share all four of these things with you very, very quickly. They're not easy to grasp all of them, but I'll let you know right now, this is the key. This is the door that we need to walk through uh, and, uh, and embrace and move quickly on. So first one, they said, well, Lynn, uh, here's the thing. We were taught, number one, that innovation, this is the word, Innovation is very, very important. The most successful companies innovate on a regular basis and they're not afraid to experiment and they try different things and it seems to, you know, uh, go really well for them, better than most people, right? Better than most companies. So we want to work for a company where there's innovation. But when we talk to people and apply for jobs and we go around the state and we, we interview and so on with various business owners and we bring this up to them, they don't want to talk about it. They don't even, <laughs> they don't have a point of view about it. They kind of say, no, we, you know, we, we don't do that. We're, we're, we're working hard and succeeding already with what we've already been doing, et cetera. So it's a, a, it's a very kind of a cursory swipe where they say, no, 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 we're not. Interested. So that, 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 that's hard because they've devoted many, many hours and even years to studying innovation. Secondly, the style of communication, many of the business owners in the state of Nebraska still are baby boomers or maybe Gen X, and they approach communication with the employees in kind of a command and control, just get it done, this, this, and this, let me know when you're done, we'll move on to the next thing, goodbye, I'm over here, right? These young folks were taught to collaborate, share ideas, work together in fluid partnerships, 
So that's, there are two things right there. We don't know how to innovate. We don't think it's very important. And we don't know how to communicate with the Gen Z. The third one is that downtown. Downtowns kind of got forgotten in Nebraska several years ago. They're back now because density is critical. Relationship building is critical. 25-year-olds and 65-year-olds are going to be meeting in downtown and Nebraska all over. Very important to rehab them, make them contemporary. Don't worry about the retail piece, but make them look great. And even consider sharing uh, residences uh, to, uh, to keep costs down. And then the fourth thing I heard from Metropolitan Community College, they said, look, everything's cool, but you got to emphasize business succession is very difficult in Nebraska. Young people want to take over companies, but they can't find it. Older folks want to get rid of their company, sell it, find financing, somehow find somebody young who has the responsibility, the employees are, are comfortable with them and so on. Very difficult to pull that together in some kind of a confidential, discreet fashion. So there are four key issues. Now, when we come back from the sponsorship, our promotional sponsorship is coming up right up after this. And I'll tell you about three men who are largely, not entirely, but largely responsible for creating a path, a way for young professionals to come into Nebraska, stay here, and have a very, very successful career and so on. But at any rate, that's the, that's the beginning and that is the solution in, in large part to the problem that Nebraska has. We've called it brain drain for years and uh, it's critical that we embrace new strategies new information, new data, and we're eager to share that information with you. You know, this show is brought to you by a new organization here in the Nebraska area, and I have to tell you, it's pretty exciting to learn about what they are doing. They've caught on to a different business model. Uh, the name of the organization is Power Podcast. The Power Podcast organization has figured out how to utilize podcasting. And by the way, we're talking about 10 minute podcasts, not, oh, I don't know, 45 minute or 90 minute or whatever. And those, those are great too, but these are, we're talking now about 10 minute podcasts. And here's how it works. Very interesting, again, think about the business model and think about, by the way, this is B2B. This is a business to business solution to a serious problem. And, and, and the problem is this, and I'm not exaggerating here, Sales closings are way down. Sales development, I don't care what organization you're in, you're a construction company, you're over here in a commercial HVAC organization, whatever it is, but people are not buying quite as readily as, as they have in the past. Things are slowed down and a lot of sales managers are really frustrated. They don't know what to do and, and not, the statistics are just not adding up. So power, the Power Podcast plan uh, can possibly solve that entire problem. Now, here's how it works. The, uh, it's, it, we're talking about three clusters of podcasts, right? So, and it's a three-week agenda, so to speak. So if an organization here in the state of Nebraska wants to do something like this, they have to set aside three weeks. The first week, by the way, are, uh, uh, the, uh, the organization puts together two 10 minute podcast, right? About the client company that is hiring them and paying them. But the client company is also paying them to do two more podcasts very next week, week two. And those two podcasts should be done, um, how do I say this? In, a, in an upbeat, flattering fashion for the company's, uh, the first company's uh, two best customers. Think of your two best customers. You're gonna flatter them, you're gonna thank them, you're gonna stroke them, you're gonna do all kinds of uh, positive uh, English, you know, podcasting. And you've got, of course, got your guy who's gonna take care of it or woman. And they're gonna say great things and they're going to do the research and speak highly of your clients. And your clients are gonna become more loyal because they didn't ask for this. They're buying their product from you and everything's going fine and all of a sudden, You've got a podcast that uh, your vendor has produced about you. I'm talking now on behalf of the, of the client, the customer, and uh, thrilled. You can do whatever you want to do with a podcast, but it speaks highly of you and your team and your product line and so on. But now we go to the next level. So we started out with the 
core client, started out and then we moved to the next two customers. But now the core client has prospects. Every sales department has a group of some people. We'd love to do business with that company and we can't seem to get a hold of them, but we'd like to work with those people. It seems like they're doing cool stuff, right? So these two organizations, we go back into the studio. We do, again, a podcast for one of them, podcast for the other one, 10 minutes of insight about this company, positive, again, I can't emphasize that enough, speaking highly, respectful, intellectual, interesting, everything about these two companies. And you're going to, again, once again, kind of flatter these companies. And you're going to, without any discussion with them, by the way, this will be kind of a pleasant surprise. And so the core client will say, hey, you might want to take a look at this. You'll find this interesting. And when they listen to a professional podcast, they cannot believe they're going to be um, um, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but they're going to certainly be pleased to hear some professionals speaking so highly about them. And of course, they have nothing to do with podcasts, don't know anything about it. And here, and here this organization is doing the Power Podcast for them. Now, what that ha does at that point is obviously lays the groundwork for a respectful uh, dialogue, a back and forth dialectic positive, upbeat, thank you. How did you know this much about us? Gee, you did all this research for us. Sure, we, we, we'd be open to visiting with you down the road. It seems uh, very interesting that you've done this, right? So here we go. Two, two, and two. This is the Power Podcast formula, and it really begins to get things going. Employees of the core client are, are thrilled and uh, kind of excited and that we're involved finally with podcasting and then you have your your two clients over there and everybody is kind of happy the relationship is good but now it's becoming great and then of course we have the prospects so like we 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 barely understand know who you guys are and you've done this for us we can't believe you did this incredible you're very creative why don't you come on over let's have some coffee and maybe we need to take a closer look at your product lineup again because we had no idea you would do this for us all right so Power Podcast opens new doors, creates loyalty with your existing customers, and gets your existing, uh, gets your employees excited, enthused, proud, huh? proud. So that's what Power Podcast is all about, and uh, we're happy to have them as sponsors right here for Wild Biz Nebraska. Thanks for listening. This is a very exciting organization. We'll get back to you and tell you how things are going with the Power. But look them up. Find Power Podcast. And maybe you'd like to do that kind of thing yourself down the road. All right. Thank you so much for focusing on Power Podcast and our new sponsors right here of Wild Biz Nebraska. Now, I want to talk with you and come back to what we were discussing before, the importance here in the state of Nebraska, some of the people that have played a role. We've identified the four key ideas that would kind of uh, enable the state of Nebraska to attract and retain at all, I have to ask this question. What if 183 communities took the advice, took the advice that I just shared with you a few minutes ago, just before we went into the, uh, into the, uh, the mid-show promotional sponsorship? What if they did all those things, right? <laughs> Learned how to innovate, right? Coaching and moving and trying, little research. What can we sell? How can we create value, right? doing new things, getting people excited inside the company that we are, are looking for new ideas and so on, and then changing, consciously changing our communication style, right? And then, of course, moving into the downtown area, revitalizing it and so on, helping people come together downtown, and then finally a business succession. Anyway, so, so who kind of got this started? You know, we've heard this phrase, connect the dots. We've all heard that before, we kind of put together things. I'm going to share with you, uh, towards the back end of the show, um, how we connect the dots and how these three gentlemen really made, is, made it easier for us to think about how we can succeed in revitalizing the state of Nebraska. Now, number one, we're going to go all the way back, well over 30 years ago, a gentleman named David Hubble, um, he discovered how to unleash positive vibes, <laughs> how to make all of us, any of us, happier, feel good about ourselves, have a calmness, but an enthusiasm, 
I'm going to tell you how this happened. David Hubble and a guy named Roger Sperry analyzed the human brain uh, over a 30-year period of time. And they, they tested, of course, all kinds of ideas, and they put things in front of people, a broad variety of people, and they saw uh, with high contrast, and maybe it's a big picture that's black and white, right, or any kind of opposite. Uh, I, would, I would say um, synthesis and... Uh, well, that, that, that would be a word that kind of explains it together. But the black and white idea is the best because what, what happens is it goes through the visual cortex into the middle of the brain. It goes right through the retina and it scintillates, stimulates a portion of our brain. And that releases a, a hormone that we all have inside of our body called dopamine. Right? So when dopamine is kind of moving through your body, uh, in, in greater than average amounts, you feel particularly good. You're a little bouncy, you're happy, uh, you kind of are in a good mood. Uh, you can shrug off negativity. So that's what we're talking about here. He discovered how to, to, to stimulate um, good vibes. Now, you've heard that phrase before, but we're talking about from a scientific point of view, when somebody walks into a living room. Now, we're talking about the built environment now. We're talking about downtown talking about architecture, rehabilitating, trying to get downtown spiffed up so we can attract these young folks. And so they utilize opposites of all sorts. Could be wood and metal, wood and glass, organic, synthetic, all right? But opposites together could be in the outside, the facade of the building. You walk into the lobby, same thing, chairs and tables combining metal and wood very often. And, and so this is how people go, wow, this is, this is really great. I love it, right? And this was discovered by David Hubble, H-U-B-E-L, in 1981. Mr. Uh, Dr. Hubble received a, a Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize research, and uh, it was an incredible breakthrough. And now we're applying it to architecture right now, this particular moment. So number one, <laughs> Economic developers, mayors, you all need to be able to get into the downtown thing again, make it attractive, pull it together. And by the way, a lot of older folks would like to move downtown as well so they don't have to uh, take care of the dog and, uh, you know, handle uh, the lawn and so on and so forth. Now, secondly, we're going to move ahead several, about 20 years past David Hubble's discovery and insight into, and by the way, it's now called neuroaesthetics. So if you call up an architect and say, do you know anything about neuroaesthetics? At this point, most of them will say, I don't know what you're talking about. I know about biophilics, having, having plants and so on inside of offices to increase productivity, but I don't know what neuroaesthetics is. This is cutting edge that we're discussing right now. Now, a few years later, a gentleman named Paul Ray conducted a research. He analyzed all of America, all of America, and he decided, he found out that we have three basic basic types of people in America today. Three different sections, three different types of lifestyles, attitude, philosophy, and so on. And the third group, 50 million younger people. At this point, they're about uh, in their early 40s, somewhere between 35 and 45. We call them urban naturals. People in the past have called them cultural creatives. But anyway, he identified in detail what they like, what they don't like, their style. They're mostly eclectic. They love pulling opposites together, different things that people wouldn't, uh, you know, could be, again, rural and urban, for instance. That's why we call them urban naturals. They enjoy doing that. That's how they design their homes and their offices. So <clears throat> Dr. Hubble came up with the notion that these buildings could actually stimulate and attract people. This gentleman, Paul Ray, made it clear who we're trying to attract. <laughs> this is the target audience. I've asked people all over the state of Nebraska, who are you actually trying to attract here in your community? They go, I don't know. I don't know. Anybody who, who comes, I guess, would be, the, would be the answer. And then finally, in the mid-90s, and now I'm going to talk to you about marketing, the importance of marketing here in Nebraska. That's a struggle. Uh, design and marketing, innovation and marketing, that's the thrust of this entire dialogue with you. That's what we don't have. That's what we don't have. Now, this gentleman's name was Peter Drucker. He died about uh, in the mid-90s, I guess it was. But he said something that's so profound for all businesses and communities who are trying to attract people, trying to attract companies, and so on. He said, only two things matter. 
Only two things matter, marketing and innovation. Everything else is an expense. Just think about that for just a minute. The, it's kind of profound, it's simple. Marketing and innovation are what matter, everything else just an expense. So if we can somehow combine and take advantage of Dr. David Hubble's insight into neuroaesthetics, Paul Ray, as the gentleman, was the researcher that identified the people that were trying to attract the knowledge workers, very well educated, um, and uh, people who want many of the same things we all do, but they have a distinctive tweak on the whole deal. And then, of course, Peter Drucker, who says, market, 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 identify your target audience and use emotional verbiage to attract them. All right. So there we go. That, that is the way to get it done here in the state of Nebraska. Not everybody understands some of the things I've said. We've shortened it all up, but this could be a seminar. This could be a seminar in 183 communities. Nearly a hundred, nearly a thousand people uh, uh, need to uh, sit down and say, how do we find these people? How are they unique? What do they want? How do we get started on downtown? How can we rehabilitate our community? That's right. So my name is Lynn Hinderocker at Wild Biz Nebraska, and I appreciate you sticking with us all the way through. This is a complex topic. It's something very few people have even heard, much less begin to act upon. But there are a number of communities right now that are looking at this formula, and we're excited to be able to introduce it to you early in this chapter of revitalization right here in Nebraska, stopping and clogging brain drain and uh, um, uh, preventing the, the re related tax problems. If we don't get that done, obviously taxes have to go up. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. This is Wild Biz Nebraska. We'll talk to you the very next time. Thank you so much for coming in. And don't forget, we want to say it again, Power Podcast, dynamite operation, great business model. Check them out. Take advantage, if it's appropriate, for your organization. Thanks again. Bye-bye.